Okay. So what's going on here? Let's see if I get this straight. If you're beginning to wonder, oh, Brown has a problem with this kingship thing. Yeah, you're right. <clears throat> Here's the deal, guys. God says, Hi, you just sit on your tuchus all the time and study my son. And all those good deeds you're not doing because you're too busy studying my son, I'll do for you. You want any particular good deed done? You ask me. My son said, ask anything in my name and I'll do it. He didn't say ask some things. He didn't say ask only for the things that you feel that you have a right to ask. He said anything. Are we going to take him at his word or not? And of course that's what this trial is about. Whose word are you listening to? Whose word are you learning? God's, the world's, meaning Satan's, or your own. That's the whole deal here. The soul lives on words. Your body does what it does based on what your soul is thinking. Okay, then what are you thinking? Whose thoughts? And who's hearing your thinking? God. The angels in the trial happen to be walking by your house at the time you're sitting there thinking, or wherever it is you are. And to a much lesser extent, people of the world are sort of hearing your thoughts too, to the extent they can read them through your body or tone or whatever it is you're saying. But you don't really have an oath of allegiance to anybody but God. I made you. I formed you. That's what he says all over the Bible. That's God's perspective on when life begins. It has nothing to do with the political baloney about abortion. You don't abort the word of God or do you? That's what's on trial here. And you're a king in training. Just because you're sitting on your tuchus and studying the word under your pastor. That's it. That's the whole spiritual life. Well, how fair is that? You're not out there soul winning like everybody else. Mm hmm. You got that. So let's get this straight. What is your life? that God wants you to have. The life God wants you to have is Hebrews 11, 6. Study my son and I will make a king out of you if you do that. Meanwhile, I'll bless the whole world and especially your periphery because you're doing what I want. Because I want to hear the smell of your thoughts learning my son rather than the smell of your thoughts doing something else. Oh. So now when I do an email, I'm thinking toward God, and I'm thinking about God, and I'm thinking about how the Bible applies to the email rather than just writing an email and wasting God's and my time. Not to mention the time of the recipient who could have been blessed while I was writing the email because I was thinking about how Bible applied to it. And you can just bet the competence in the email would be better too. See... Whatever you do, there's a recipient. Question is who? And what's the quality of what you're doing? That's what everybody's harping on, right? Performance. Whose performance is better? God's or yours? That's a no contest. So if you're busy trying to apply Bible to your email, to taking out the trash, to washing the dishes, to going to the opera, to buying your 16th Maserati, then the quality of what you're doing is going to be better. You might not notice how it's better. It might look on the surface even the same. It won't be. Because your motive is different. You're living to God. 
2 Corinthians 5.14 just flew into my head. We don't live for ourselves, we live to God now. It doesn't matter what we are in the eyes of the world or to our own eyes. We were bought with a price, we belong to God, we're kings in training, we belong to his family now, not the world anymore. And that seems like a snub, and it is. But if the world understood just how much blessing they were get, getting due to that snub, they'd say, please snub me. You can even accuse God of being arbitrary. That's what Satan's doing. I mean, you know, God says, do this, this is what I want. Do it for me. Learn my son. Learn his thinking. Sit on your tuckers all day if it takes that. But he's designed it so it doesn't have to take that. So you can still fulfill your obligations. You don't have to be a hermit. I mean, there are going to be certain days and certain weeks when you, that's all you do is study, just like it was in the Old Testament, where they got whole years off every seven just to study. They weren't to work at all. So you'll have whole days, maybe even whole weeks. I had the better part of ten years where I was just supposed to study, but that was, you know, I was doing other things at the same time, but just the ratio of time spent on anything other than study was very small. And now that time has passed. There will be days, there will be moments, there will be weeks, there will be months when that's all you do is study. But for the most part it's about an hour a day. And you use the rest of your day practicing what you study during that hour. That's your life. That's what pleases God. And since you're trying to insert the Bible into everything you do, trying to integrate it into your life, the Holy Spirit directing you the whole time because it's your life, so how it applies to you isn't necessarily how it applies to me or somebody else. Since you're doing that, that pleases God too. It's a bi-directional interface going on between God and you. So eating breakfast isn't just eating breakfast. Everything's a policy decision. Writing an email is not just an email. Going to the bathroom is not just going to the bathroom. Surfing the internet is not just surfing the internet. Driving a car isn't just driving a car. Whatever you do, do unto the Lord, right? God first. That's the first commandment. In progress. Every thought being brought into captivity. 2 Corinthians 10.5 He just threw that into my head. He throws things into your head. You figure out the difference between what's in your head that's from you, what's in your head from the demon boys throwing stuff at you, and what's in your head from God. That's John 14, 26 in operation when God's doing it. That's your life. And now every single moment has a two-universe connection. The universe toward God, which is the real universe you're going to be living in forever, and are living in now really, but you can't see it. And the two-body connection, which is all too visible and all too temporary. Now they're uniting. Now they're integrating. Now Hebrews 10.5, the association that Christ made at birth, that day of his birth, Psalm 42, 40 verse 6, a body you have prepared for me. Yeah, God's prepared a body for you too. And it's a body of evidence to Satan. All that's going on just simply by you sitting on your tuchas and studying Bible for an hour and then lamely, probably, trying to apply it to the rest of your day every day. Day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. Very unglamorous. Very unseen. Not at all like Christianity. And yet it couldn't be more like Christ-like. Matthew 4.4 4, always occurring. Hello? So let me get this straight. All I do is sit and think. Or do the dishes and think. Or go to the bathroom and think. Or write an email and think. Think what? Bible. Think what? Toward God. Think what? About what God thinks of what I'm doing. Think what? 
about what I'm learning from this thing I'm thinking and doing. Whatever it is. And whatever it is is small on the surface. But beneath what's happening, God is building your brain. Because what's the contract in Isaiah 53, 11? Make sons. Yarik yamim. Long lived seed. From the seed being cloned into your head. That pleases God. That's what he sees instead of seeing all the petty thinking he sees on this earth. And he likes what he sees happening in you that the Holy Spirit's doing to you so much that all those good deeds everybody else is doing badly, he makes good on. So all your fellow Christians who are out there with their baby ideas and their baby expressions and their baby emphasis on works in the body, they will think they're doing great things for God when they're not. And God's cleaning up their mess and doing great things for the world because you're on it. Studying, doing the one thing he wants. God doesn't want a tie for Christmas. He wants an iPod. But he's got to build the iPod in your head to play the tunes he wants played. And you don't even know that's going on. You're just saying yes. And what's this Bible now? Let's say, how do I apply this Bible to this email? I don't even really know, but I'm trying to guess. Okay. And you keep practicing it like practicing piano. Na 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 That's what it seems like to you on the ground. But inside, the iPod's being built and it's being, there's a tune being built at the same time that God will always see and he's infinite his pleasure is therefore infinite even though that's just a moment and you know you're making sweetheart soap with all the little stars pasted on in the wrong place but he sees that moment forever and he's pleased with it forever so he blesses the world right now and the world needs his blessing but isn't asking for it the world is trying to do things its own way. But you're trying to live God's way, on God's agenda for your life. And you don't even know what that is. You got all these words in this book that you don't understand, but you're going to learn it anyhow. Line on line, precept on precept, he builds the iPod in your soul. But you don't even know, what, you wouldn't even know where to find it. He can see it. So what else matters? So all the good deeds that are being done are being done by God in appreciation for what God is doing to you. Because what did you do? Oh, you said yes. And what did that contribute to the merit? Absolutely nothing. But he likes it. Mikey likes it, they said in that Life Serial commercial from 30 years ago. It was a serial commercial about Life Serial, which was looked like checks. Specifically rice checks. Only it was flavored very differently. And the kids all got this new cereal put in front of them. It was three kids. And one of them was a little two-year-old kid who was real picky about food. And Mikey was the name of that kid. And that kid put a spoon in the bowl and ate the spoon of the life check cereal and he smiled in the commercial it was from the 1970s <clears throat> and one of the other kids at the kitchen table said Mikey likes it and so they like the cereal too yeah and that'll happen to you also people will find out even if you don't tell them they'll find out that, that you like this bible thing that you like this Bible study. And they will be attracted to it because you are. I can't tell you how many times that's motivated people that have talked to me over the years. They've written me emails and stuff. Oh, you're so passionate. Oh, you know, you really understand. Yeah, how do you know I understand? God must have told you because I sure didn't. 
So it's contagious too. That's a blessing to others to be inspired, to find God, to find reason, to see God. Not as this ogre giving you lots of works that you have to do and then you're supposed to be dour. You know, that's Puritanism, Christianity. That's what the Reformed theologians bought us. Dour God. He's not like that. Not that it feels good to live the spiritual life. It feels pretty boring most of the time. But you're online with God. You're having contact with God. You're getting bi-directional feedback from God every day. That's the way it works. And that's always true. So, how stands the case? Let me get this straight. I just sit on my butt and I study Bible for an hour a day and then I try to use it the other 23. And that will do more good deeds than the whole world put together. At the end of which I become this king over a whole bunch of people who didn't do what I did, even though I really didn't do anything. And I, I'm, I own them forever? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but what if I don't want to own them? Okay, fine, then give away everything God gives you to them, which you'll do anyhow. You want to spend it on Christ, right? Well, how are you going to spend it? The same way you're spending it now. You basically get into a lifestyle where you're spending your entire life progressively, it doesn't happen overnight, on thinking toward God, learning Him, using what you learn. It doesn't change once you're dead. It doesn't change when you become a king. It just has like more recipients. Because after we're dead, then everybody's going to see him face to face. And he's going to be the number one topic of conversation and interest. Okay, but for most of the people, the first time they really see him will be after they're dead. It doesn't have to be like that, but that's how it turns out. Because people don't want to learn him while they're still in this body down here. They want to learn the world instead. So it's going to be a real big surprise to billions of Christians. Hopefully in the billions. Oh! Oh! Jesus Christ is gorgeous! Yes! Duh. And here's his thought pattern. And I never learned it down here. I was busy beeping my body with body works and feeding the poor and all this stuff he could have done better if I just asked him to do it. Yeah. Okay, but you're in heaven now. And now you can start learning. Yeah, and there's this king who did the learning when he was down in the body. And therefore God prepared him to be a king. And he's got the information you desperately now, post-death, want to learn. Okay, so now your life as a king is to show them. Now, all that learning you did in the body is public. All the things you did wrong are public, too. <laughs> <clears throat> but you're the king of this kingdom, and everybody wants you to be the king that you are. And they want to hear everything you got to say, honey. Because what you want to talk about is what you know, and what you know is Christ. And God will give you all kinds of assets in order to do that talking the best, which still pleases him then, even as it pleases him now, but obviously in a very different format. Now it's secret, it's low, it's slow, it's just you. Then it's public, it's mass, and it's everybody learning at the same time, hanging on every word you say. And every word you say is about him. And then they get all kinds of things to do related to the learning that they're getting from you about him. All kinds of parades and I don't know how they're going to celebrate it exactly. But all the things that people like to do down here, they get to do up there. Only this time, up there, when we're dead, it will finally all be related to him. Not merely in his name and not related to him. And you get to be the king of all that. That's worth living for. That's worth dying for. Living Christ, dying prophet. That's what Paul says in Philippians 1.21.
That's what he means. And he got it too. He got crowned. Second Timothy 4, 7, and 8. So that's the goal for all of us. Paul started out, we're a sinner who ever lived, beginning of 1 Timothy. So if the worst sinner who ever lived can get crowned, what do you think you can do? You're not as big as Paul. You can't claim to be the worst sinner who ever lived. He's the worst sinner who ever lived. Okay, well then maybe you can grow faster and higher than Paul did, which is kind of hard to imagine. But maybe it can be done. And even if not, you can grow to become a king and that blesses Christ and most importantly God likes the sound of the thinking being learned and spoken in your life he likes it now and he's gonna like it in the eternal state when you're king size then in your soul and you have a whole kingdom to give that thinking to and that's the only way they can get it because they opted to be far away from Christ yeah they're saved yeah they're in heaven okay but they're gonna get to see him on parade what once in a thousand years unless they're in your entourage and you're up there going to visit the new Jerusalem to present your tribute in the temple that's um, Revelation 22 where it says the kings will bring their glory into the temple it means taxes I want to be a king for that reason alone I want to see what that's like to call taxes a glory that way you get to be closer to him all those rewards in Revelation 3 are related to proximity to Christ. The 144,000 are going to be around him 24-7 forever as his personal entourage. 144,000 Jews. That's his personal entourage? So how ostentatious is the eternal state? Very I have a lot of trouble with that, but hey, honey, if anybody deserves ostentation, Christ surely does. Flaunt it then. And so that's what you'll get to do too. And the people, your people in your kingdom will need that and want it because they're body-oriented. They stayed body-oriented. That's the soul that they crafted down here. You're crafting your own soul by ch what you choose. Do you choose to learn Bible? In which case, yes. Then your soul becomes like Christ. In which case, no. Then your soul becomes like Satan's. Which means the old sin nature gets cut out of you the minute you die. And you got nothing else. Because all the bad gets cut out at death. Okay, well what good was there after the bad is gone? Nothing. If you spent your life on works, you got nothing. So, that's the legacy. That's the straight story of how you live the spiritual life down here. And it's weird. Hi, I sit on my tuchus for an hour a day. And the other 23, I practice Bible on uh, all the menial stuff in my life. And anything else in my life. And Holy Spirit's making me into somebody. Not what I do. Because anything you do is doo-doo, period. It's just a training device. It's lowness, it's slowness, it's irritations, it's having to pay attention to detail. That's your kingdom down here. Meanwhile, he's building your brain out of it. So that you will think like Christ. Because that pleases Father to hear it happening. Happening now, happening then once you're king. Same exact pleasure. Same exact rule. Different formats as you go through your life. Now and then. And any good deed while you're down here that you can't do or want done, what do you do? You pick up the phone and call God. Hi, Dad. I need Nigeria blessed so they can get Bible. They can't they can't learn Bible if their stomachs aren't full. I they want Bible. You can see they want Bible. They they live in these little like favela like structures, pieces of tin that are functioning like walls and they have to draw their water and walk forever to get some water in a bucket and then trundle it back to their little tin shack. 
but they dress up for Bible class with, with, with jackets and ties. And they want to learn Bible. And those kids, look at those kids in the PBS videos. They're learning Bible. That matters to them. God, please bless Nigeria. Yeah, and he has. Because I asked for it. I'm sure other people did too. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. You want the terrorist cause caught? I did. I asked him for it. Well, they got caught. Not because brain outs anybody, but because Christ is somebody. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. Not your own name. His name. Don't do your deeds. Do his deeds. Well, you can't do his deeds. Only he can do his deeds. Fine, do them to me, please. And since you're doing them to me and I'm supposed to spend my life sitting on my behind for an hour a day studying this Bible that doesn't make much sense that day and the other 23 trying to use what doesn't make much sense that day well I can't very well be doing good deeds now can I? No God please just bless Nigeria, Kenya the <coughs> bless the United States bless Russia, bless China they have needs dad I can't supply those needs, but you can. And I don't know how to supply their needs. They need Bible more than they need everything else, okay? But they can't learn Bible without getting other needs met. You can't study Bible if you're passed out due to lack of food. You can't study Bible if you're <clears throat> under fire because your country's in civil war. So... Ask first for the kingdom of God and all those other things will be added. Yeah, and in many case they're, cases they're added first in order of time. Because you got to get the free time and you have to be healthy enough to study Bible. So God will destroy the enemies. Make the crops grow. Make the politicians competent. And that benefits the politicians too because, you know, who wants to go through his life being a jerk and come to the end of his life and realize that's how he spent his life? I don't care how evil you are. You never want to come to the end of your life and realize that you wasted it. That it was for nothing. That everything you tried to accomplish, whatever, however bad or good it was, you don't want to re realize it's a waste. And granted, you know, I, I'm really not sure how I buy into this. The, you know, the common idea is that politicians are just a waste of time and they're there to waste you. I don't actually think that's true. I think what happens is they start out with these high ideals and then realize those ideals don't work. Okay, so if they're competent, or you can make their lives competent for them so that the ideals do work, well, only God can make that happen. You can pray for that. And as a royal person, you ought to. The royals do not do. The royals think. The royals determine the standard by living the standard. That's your job. God will use other people who aren't doing what you're doing to accomplish the goal you can't accomplish because he has you doing something else. Sitting on your butt for an hour a day studying Bible. Using it for the other 23 or at least 16 while you're not sleeping, intermittently and badly probably, but you're trying. Meanwhile, the Holy Spirit is building your own competence in Bible, line on line, precept on precept. So that's your legacy. That's the spiritual life. And I suppose, when you stop to think about it, it's unfair. Well, God's going to do all this for you. You have all this importance and you're just a puny human like everyone else. Uh-huh. And the same offer is open to every single human being born. Whether unbeliever or believer. Anyone can believe in Christ. Anyone who has at least once believed in Christ can get into this spiritual life. So, if they're not in it, it's because they don't want it. So you don't have to feel guilty the fa about the fact that you do. The privileges are open to everybody, but not everybody wants them. The responsibilities are open to everybody, and those who don't want them are going to get spanked and have wasted their lives. That's the biggest discipline of all. 
get to the end of your life and realize it was a big waste. So meanwhile, you're sitting here, it's your life, but do you want it to be wasted today? No. So you use 1 John 1 9, you study under your pastor, you learn and live on Bible, you talk to God about it, and occasionally to other believers when warranted. And that's your life. And then God therefore blesses the world with good deeds that they couldn't even do. And he makes you a king so that this life and what you learn down here gets to be communicated to those who didn't want to learn it down here, but once they're dead, they're going to want it very badly. That's your legacy. That's Christ's legacy on the cross to us. That's what the whole Bible is about. That's what the New Covenant is. That's what the book of Hebrews is explaining in the book of Ephesians. So that's the legacy, and it brings up the question, well, it's not fair. Well, yeah, it is fair, because everybody can have it, but won't take it. But it brings up a deeper question. Why is this what God wants? He could want other things. Why does he want you to just sit on your butt and learn Bible and then try to insert it in the rest of your day? Why is that his choice of what pleases him? Hebrews eleven six, Matthew 4, 4. Why is that his choice? It seems arbitrary. And that's where we'll pick up in episode 11.